Hi. Hey, everybody. Um, this week, we're going to begin by focusing on the concept, okay? The idea first, think about what the idea means to you, write down some notes about it, explore the idea, um, and then think about what kind of forms you'll create to, you know, express that idea, and then how you're going to organize them into a composition. So the idea for this week is going to be confrontation. So the first thing you want to do is write down the word, um, examine the word, what does it mean to you, what ideas come to mind, and where do those ideas take you? You know, take a moment to write those things down, and then start doing some thumbnail sketches. Again, very small sketches to explore the potential ways you could um, use that idea in a composition. And then take those thumbnail sketches and develop those into more um, complete compositions for your final project. So this isn't really related as much to this week, but you know, it's when you're working with thumbnail sketches, if you if you start thinking about developing the forms as three-dimensional forms in perspective, you can create more convincing images and actually really be able to imagine and think about how those forms could really exist in real space and how you might relate to them, you know, in real space. This particular design uh, was created. This was a vehicle that was designed to be more fuel efficient. So everything about it is created in a way that makes it more streamlined, uh, more lightweight. Uh, the, the wheels are separated from the body and they're in a streamlined uh, casing to, to make them less wind resistant. There's three wheels instead of four. Uh, you wouldn't see this, but it has a very fuel efficient energy. I think it's probably a, a hybrid motor because this thing gets about 270 miles to the gallon. And it's only seats too. It looks to me like the seats themselves are probably fairly lightweight. Uh, so, so again, when the person designed this, when the designer created this, it was everything about it was made in a way to make it more uh, fuel efficient and more aerodynamic. This was actually a plate designed to make it more appealing. Okay, when you're trying to make a dessert seem appealing when you present it on a plate, uh, here the consideration was the fact that the plate was circular. Okay, they could have put it on a square plate, but the pie itself has a circular characteristic to it. Um, the outer form of the pie is circular. So they use that with a circular plate, with a circle inside the circle on the plate. And then within the pie itself, it has a re repetition of circles uh, within the, the pattern that crosses around the pie itself. So the, the person, the, the chef, didn't stop there. They put strawberries off to the right, which is an anomaly uh, within this design. And they connected it to the pie by putting a circular line around that and then transitioning over to where the pie is. Now, the pie itself uh, stands out because it's not a circle. It's actually a triangle, triangular with a circular back end, but nonetheless a triangle. And it's also a dark shape against a light, light ground. So in a way, it presents itself uh, in, a, in a way that really stands out. So you notice it most when you're being presented the pie. Makes you want to eat it, doesn't it? So here we have a designer dog. Well, how, how would you say is a dog designed? Well, a lot of the dogs, full uh, thoroughbred dogs, are uh, actually designed to be have particular characteristics. This one was designed to be a perfect couch potato. Uh, this was my dog, and, and he actually was the perfect couch potato. Spent a lot of time there. Okay, this uh, is basically the concept of <clears throat> cultural norms. Okay, so when you when you have things in your society which you know are basically understood, like the idea of perspective, you know, the idea that uh, the lines that converge towards the horizon uh, convey the idea that things are moving into the distance, makes you look at this and understand that there are just trying to make you feel like you're gonna looking down a road that goes off into the distance. A little cactus is to the side, you know, they're a little line art, but they convey the idea of cactus. So we have certain things that we can look at as our, that our conventions, that as a society, we understand and, and can understand them being used in a composition to express a story or an idea. There's another one. This is, if you were in Florida and you're used to a lot of water being around, you'd probably look at this and you'd think, those are waves, right? Well, if you were to live in a desert and there wasn't water around, then maybe you look at that and see it as ripples in the sand. So depending on what is the, more of the cultural norm, uh, where you're at, what you create will uh, be read by different people in different areas. Uh, depends on their cultural norms. I want to just touch on briefly the idea of 
representational art versus purely abstract art. Now, this is a transition for an artist, Jackson Pollock, from some more, somewhat more uh, representational work that he did as he kind of pushed himself to become more purely abstract. So what you'll see in here is um, you can see the, the head shape in the upper left and then the, the hands. There is another head right here. This is, he was a very confrontational person. This is clear as some kind of confrontation. You got the kind of, you know, blood red looking lines, uh, the aggravated space. Everything about it seems fairly chaotic and aggravated. And so, again, there's a lot of abstract um, thing, elements playing out in here, but there's still an element of representation. That is things you might see in the real world. Now, as he progressed with his work, he created some of the first purely abstract paintings. Can't say they're my, my favorite paintings because they're, they're simply splattered paint. Uh, and it's sort of like, uh, I don't know what call it, just uh, huge uh, action paintings where you're seeing splatters. And, um, but the, the most interesting thing about them is the fact that they, at that time, it was one of the first paintings that was purely based on just color and shape and form. It was about nothing other than what was happening within the painting. So it's not telling a story. Um, it's not conveying ideas outside of the painting other than pure abstract shape. So this is a close-up of some of the shapes. And what you can see is when you're dealing with abstract color as opposed to representational color, you're dealing with just how one color set next to another color will either move forward or backwards, connect to it, or separate from it. So when you have colors that are um, separate in tone uh, or separate in hue, they're going to gonna move away from each other. One is either going to move forward or backwards. Warmer, lighter colors are going to move forward. Cooler, darker tones are going to push backwards. So when you have a warm orange next to a cooler violet or a, you know, even a lighter blue, those cooler tones will set back and that warmer orange will press forward. The white is going to press forward the most because it's the lightest. Now, oddly enough, white is also cool, depending on the actual color of white, because there's a lot of different variations of white. Uh, if the white has a, a cool tone to it, uh, it has more of a, almost like a blue, cold sensibility. So, you know, it could kind of go either way, but because of the tone, it's generally going to press forward, okay? So, again, pure abstract color is just color that uh, moves forward or backwards or connects or disconnects from colors around it. Now, we deal with this uh, painting by um, Kendi uh, Wiley. Kenny Wiley, he uh, is using both abstract use of color, which is um, in the background, you see the patterns, which is just basically one color next to another and the tone moves the space forward or backwards or separates it or connects it. And then he's using some of the same patterning ideas you know, across the, the uh, um, outfit that the figure is wearing. But then the figure itself is, is rendered very representationally, a sense of radiation to light to dark, so in here, the color is uh, feeling like it's responding to light. It's moving from light side to dark side. So there's a gradation of tone and separation between, um, you know, one plane and another of the form, representing realistic forms that you would see them in, in the real world. So again, he plays with that idea between abstract forms and uh, representational forms within his compositions. Here's another example. Uh, this is one where he's actually using a lot of times you use figures posed as you would find them in a uh, painting from the Renaissance and then use them with a modern figure and then poses them against, you know, these backgrounds, which this one, again, is purely pattern um, and a good, really fun use of the, the use of color uh, energy that's, that's happening with these patterns. And so, again, I kind of enjoy the way he uses these different patterns in, in his compositions uh, relative to the representational forms. Yeah, in this particular instance, the patterns are, again, are very are representational forms, but they're used more for their abstract quality. Now, one of the most important things that we're working with right now is economy, okay? You're only allowed to use black and white, so you're not using color, uh, you're not using gradation, so you're not creating three-dimensional form through the idea of uh, gradation from light to dark side. Uh, you're just using black and white. So here you have a Matisse where he's been very economical. He's, he's eliminated color. He's eliminated even uh, the idea of black and white spaces. It's just black black space with white line. And he puts the white line down with a very specific quality 
um, sort of calligraphy kind of quality of thick to thin line, but it's all put down in a single stroke. In fact, you would spend a lot of time pre, pre, you know, planning the stroke. You'd go over it and over and over uh, before you actually put the stroke down. And so he'd know for sure that when he put the stroke down, it'd be exactly what he wanted. But he, he again, he put very little information in so he could control the expression. So you control your expression by limiting what you put in, not by putting everything in. So again, the idea of two-dimensional versus three-dimensional space, two-dimensional space has an x, y axis, which means basically you got x, y, okay, how it relates to this plane or that plane, or I mean this, this line or that line within the plane, all right? And three-dimensional space, you're moving from that x, y axis to z, which means moving forward in volume. Z represents volume. So in a, in a sculpture, that's what you're going to be seeing is the actual three-dimensional form. And so you see there, you know, the shift from light to dark side is the forms uh, being hit by light from the one side. And then you could feel, I mean, you can literally feel how you, the form wraps around in space and has three-dimensional form. So again, very different two-dimensional form, three-dimensional form. This is another artist, Mondrian, who works in two-dimensional space, okay? He's part of uh, the minimalist movement where they, you know, again, eliminate a lot of the elements. They wanted you to feel the flatness of the work of art. You know, so, I mean, that, I guess that has its place. Again, it was about uh, isolating and being expressive within a limited means. So what he limited himself here to was a primary color scheme with it's just yellow, red, and blue, three colors. It's a color, a triad color scheme. And then just black and white. Again, black and white are not colors. They're just tones. Okay, so don't make the mistake of thinking black is a color, white is a color. It's not. Now, this is a triad color scheme, and they could have actually mixed black and white with these colors to create different tones and tints. But it's more about, um, again, for here, it's just pure color and pure line to uh, create purely abstract compositions. Now, you can also create a sense of depth by having what's called overlapping, by having one shape in front of another by using the idea of perspective, that converging lines. You can also create what's called atmospheric perspective, where you feel like there's, well, atmospheric perspective basically is if there's moisture between you and the object, which there is in the air. And so depending on how much moisture there is, if it's raining outside, you'll notice it a lot more. It's much more immediate. This things gray out almost immediately in front of you. But as you look at things in the distance, there's moisture between you at that form in the distance, and they'll become more desaturated, which means grayed down, less color, and fainter as they move in the distance. So we have these compressing lines, overlapping shapes, and you can tell, again, it's a black shape on top of a black shape. You can see the shapes because they're defined by a white outline that separates the two things. Now here you also have the purely abstract use of tone to make the, to show um, depth. You have, you have a dark tone, and the light tone of the, this lighter gray makes those texts stand out and push forward. And the even lighter gray here, or white, actually presents for, uh, for the most. So depending on the tone, things are going to push forward or set back. So you see that again here. Now this is an interesting thing, and that's called figure ground reversal. This is something you have to be careful of because you have, if you have a 50% yeah, 50, 50 breakup of light and dark, then you can create what's called figure ground reversal. Um, and also the, uh, the figures have to have the same contour as the ground. Okay, so here you have a white fish. When you look at the white fish, it appears to be the positive shape. The black appears to be the negative space. But then when you look at the black shape, the reverse happens. The black appears to be the positive space, and the, neg the negative space appears to be the uh, white shapes. So because there's a 50 50 breakup of black and white, and the shapes kind of line up with one another, you can kind of flip flop between those back and forth. And this is a MC Escher. Picture. He does that a lot in his compositions, using that figure ground reversal. So the emotional impact depends on how you distort the form, how you change the form. And so here you have two examples of a Picasso, one in the blue period and one much later on in his life. Where, and in the blue period, he used, he used here a um, complementary color scheme using just violet and yellow, creating a lot of, when you mix those two, you get what's called neutral grays. And so the primary thing he did here was he eliminated the color almost by making almost all neutral grays. And so he created a very desaturated, kind of depressing looking image. And so the, the figure's shoulders are elongated, 
she's kind of um, emaciated looking. And so, you know, there's there's a lot to indicate here, the depression, the darkened eyes, you know, sort of just everything about it feels sullen, the hair feels kind of matted, and she's pushing all her weight down on this iron. So, so again, you feel the depression here, and then you look at the one to the right, and there's a very different kind of, I almost more anxiety-related uh, emotion. And he's really exaggerated the forms more here. He said, you know, they're a bit more cartoon, but he's got these eyes, eyeballs, almost like boats, uh, gnashing teeth. Uh, the shapes are kind of clumsy and, you know, unattractive, you know, so that the emotion he's trying to express is, is not something of beauty. It's, it's some sort of a terror. And he's, he's almost um, created a form that's almost nightmarish uh, by using kind of amplified colors, sort of uh acid yellow and green, um, even the red's kind of desaturated. So there's a lot of things going on, not only with color, but the shapes and how they're distorted to exaggerate the emotion that he's trying to express in this form. So depending on how you stylize your forms, you can you know create uh, emotions in, in one direction or another, depending on what you're trying to achieve. And again, it's very important to remember that generally you read a composition from upper left to bottom right. So when you look at this, composition here the, the designer is moving you from the left to the right okay the balls appear to be coming into the design from the left and moving towards the right there's a line cutting all the way across and then there's an old car and then a new car the old car is behind the new car and kind of heading towards that direction so you feel like in this design they're trying to get across the idea that you're going from the old to the new and it's really a a corporate um, annual report and they're showing basically how they've gone from the old and things are progressing forward. And so that's what you're going to find inside the report. They want to have you that concept working for you as you go into the report. But you can see the idea again of start from the upper left to the bottom right with this greeting uh, stamp. Uh, at the top left, it says greetings. There's a rectangular uh, shape that's pointing you down. And then there's a stop here with a, a different colored gray, slightly different than the background, separates it. And then from there, you go to this shape that's like a slide. It takes you down, you land on the nose. The nose pulls you in towards the face. The eyeball here gets your attention first. Then you're drawn down this way. There's a V pointing you down here. And then you're, you have these little shapes, these button shapes that are pushing you towards the 29 at the bottom. So there's a lot of repetition of circles here. In the background, there is the repetition that creates sort of a, a norm for the background. There's, they're repeated in a way that really doesn't draw your attention that much. You become more of a pattern. Uh, some of these other shapes that are repeated draw your attention more because of how they are put in proximity to other shapes than how they move your eye, you know, from one place to another. Basically, depending on how things stand out and grab your attention and then move you to the next space, you know, will determine the pace that you move through the composition. So you've got a repetition, you've got variation, and you've got a pace uh, created by how your eye moves from one shape to another, how quickly that happens, and how, you know, again, how interesting your eyes are as they move from one thing to another, you know, and how quickly that happens. So you're kind of setting a, a pace with repetition, and then with anomalies, you know, setting stops within the design. So it causes you to pause and think. So here we have a Van Gogh, similar kind of thing happening here. You know, a number of different uh, images like stars and wind. Uh, you got a tree and you got little buildings down here and a hill. So these things, again, if you start, it really feels like you're starting from the upper left, and you're going through all these shapes, and you're ending up at the bottom right in the little village at the bottom. Um, one of the things that he repeats here, not only are, you know, you have the stars, you have some buildings, things like that, things are repeated, but there's actually the brush strokes. The brush strokes are probably the most important thing that he repeats, and you know, if you look closely, you'll see all the little strokes. There's a similar type of stroke that he uses in almost all of his paintings. So that really becomes one of the, the signature elements of his compositions. And a lot of that has to do with the way that he understood that color worked and, and the impressionist concepts. I'll go into that later. But uh, you know, that the main key to, to focus on there is the repetition of those strokes within the composition. You know, it creates a lot of energy, dynamics, and movement, and also adds a consistency throughout all the forms. Another design here showing you how you can use uh, repetition to sort of tell a story. So what you have here is an engineering uh, uh, 
one of the things to, to set up for a convention to you know, so give you all the information about the convention at the front, they're showing what appears to be a bunch of dots and shapes, but what it really is is logos of four people with their heads, the dots in the center, coming together to form a new design. Okay, so they come together and again, their shapes stop right here at a square. So they're not just pointing in towards the center, they're also creating a new shape through their combination. So it's about, you know, coming together with new ideas and creating a new form. Last thing is this simple idea of morphing, of taking two things and combining them together to create a new form, uh, which can actually tell a story, like putting a tiger in your tank. So this is from an advertisement where if you put a particular kind of uh, oil or gas in your car, you actually turn your, your motor into a tiger and you take off running down the road like a crazy animal. So um, morphing is one of the things you can do. It's kind of fun uh, to actually combine two different ideas together to create a new one. So with this project, you're going to be doing, you're just going to be using circles, okay? You're going to use a circle template similar to this. Uh, you can get these at um, Office Depot or Office Max, probably the cheapest you can get them. And you're going to be doing shapes just out of circles. You're going to, and so you have to know what you can do with the circle. So with a circle, you could put a black dot against a white background, a white dot against a black background, a uh, white dot against a white background where it disappears, and a black dot against a black background where it disappears. Or you could put a white, a white circle against a black background. No, a white circle against a white background with a black outline, and reverse with black. Okay, black circle against black round, black background with a white outline. So they'll still stand out. You won't lose them. You may wonder why you want to put a white shape against a white background. Well, if you put a white shape in front of a black shape, in front of a white background, you create a new shape by what you cut out of the black shape. So with this project, you can either have circles separated, touching, overlapping by showing a little white outline there, intersecting, creating a new shape like you see right here, or completely overlapping, creating like a peanut shape, or cutting away from one another like you're seeing here or here, or intersecting and leaving the shape in between, or just being a circle by overlapping the two. So those are the different ways you can actually use the circle to create new shape. So in your composition, you're gonna to have to have a super unit. And I'm gonna to have to cut this short pretty fast. So you have to have at least four super units within the composition. And so you have to have um, four of the same shape repeated within the composition. So within this one, you have super units. So the super unit is Really simple. It's at least two circles put together to create a new form. So here you have multiple circles come together to create a new form. And let me show you the simplest way that can be done. Right here. If you have, as it has here, there's four super units, which are basically the donut tires. All right. So I'm going to have to cut this short, come back to another short recording, just going over some of the examples because I've run out of time. Um, I'll come back at you guys going over these other examples in just a little bit. All right? And have a good day.